Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Tableau Conference. So, uh, a little loud. All right. So, uh, today uh, we have a lot to get through, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, today's topic, as of course you know, is how to monitor Tableau server at scale. So, uh, my name is Zach Geis. I work with JP Morgan Chase, and uh, I'm going to talk through uh, kind of our journey at Chase and how we use. Tableau to monitor Tableau. So uh, we'll talk through uh, kind of how Tableau is set up inside of uh, JP Morgan. We'll sh go through an actual demo of a Tableau application that we built. And so I'd like to spend a lot of my time actually in Tableau. So that's kind of the goal of the session is the meaty part of it is actually spending time in Tableau, showing what you can do, and uh, talking through some narratives with that. And then um, going through some tips of how you can do the same. So some things that we've learned on our journey uh, that you can take advantage of and uh, kind of get started on your way with that as well. So again, welcome. I uh, appreciate you guys cho choosing this session as your first one of the conference. Uh, before we get started, a little bit about myself. So as I mentioned, uh, my name is Zach Geis. I'm a BI Solutions Engineer at JP Morgan. So I've been there about four years, and my role is really just to make Tableau successful. So um, I'm very passionate about data and analytics, and especially data visualization. I'll talk through a little bit about why that's so important to me, but um, it's really just, it's my world. So even at work, uh, outside of work, I spend a lot of time uh, with everything on Tableau and on their site and, and posting about it. So uh, a few other things, I've been using Tableau for a while, so uh, about seven years. I'm a desktop certified professional, so I went through all the exams for desktop certification, um, and also I'm pretty active on Twitter. So uh, if you follow me on there, at Zach's uh, you'll see kind of how I post about Tableau, some of my actual um, external work uh, on Tableau Public, and uh, just a lot about data viz. So feel free to follow me on there. And uh, speaking of my work, as I mentioned, uh, I do a lot of data visualization in my evenings as well. So again, very passionate about data and visualization. So just a, a little bit of a sample of some of my work from Tableau Public from different initiatives like Makeover Monday to Data for a Cause to Viz for Social Good. Um, you can find all my work on Tableau Public just by searching for my name. So uh, that's me. Again, I, I just love data, and uh, I hope you'll hear some of that passion as we go through um, the uh, topics at hand. So uh, the agenda, just to go into a little bit more detail, is uh, I'll talk through how Tableau is uh, set up here at JP Morgan and how we use it day to day, a little bit of some metrics and key numbers about our setup, uh, going right into a demo of what's called TabSpy. So this application that is built on top of uh, the Postgres reporting out of uh, uh, Tableau, so the database that sets up, that's set up behind uh, Tableau, and uh, talking through after that how you can do it too. And uh, even taking those different insights and providing them to the business, because it's not as useful when it's just you as a server admin or you as an owner of the product. And then just a little bit about what's coming next with TabSpy and with uh, Tableau at JPM Chase. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into the agenda. So uh, Tableau at JP Morgan. So Tableau, we have a enterprise licensing agreement with uh, Tableau. We've had it for about a year, and it's a uh, subscription-based. So uh, we renew each year. We have a very high volume of users and consumption and usage. Um, just in the two years since my team took over Tableau, we've had tenfold user growth and consumption. So uh, we've been very passionate about just making Tableau the BI platform of choice for the, uh, the firm at large. So uh, going through these, we have currently 30,000 uh, server users across our environments. Uh, we have 3,000 desktop users, and both of these numbers we plan to drastically grow within this next year. So we're working on renewing those, those kind of the agreement with Tableau and, and, and moving those numbers up and getting uh, just more and more consumers and developers across the platform. We have 25 different Tableau server environments. So yeah, we have production. We have different production environments and different niche servers that are really suited just for specific use cases. So some that support um, actual applications that have different SLAs. And we have a giant um, CCB-specific, um, uh, consumer banking-specific 
uh, server that's built for the majority of the firm that we, ho we own uh, as a team. Uh, and just in that specific uh, server environment for consumer banking, we have over 470 projects. So these projects, uh, the way that we use projects in our environment is for different teams. So there's a little bit of overlap, but there's over 400 different teams that are using Tableau. So they're using it day in, day out, developing, integrating with their other analytics and their other data needs, and just providing this to um, pretty much every line of business across the entire globe. So we have users um, at every location in every line of business. Um, using Tableau just in their day-to-day -day life. So it's, uh, it's very big and important to J.P. Morgan. So a little bit about the data, just to understand. We don't have just one nice, clean setup for the data, as most companies don't. We have pretty much everything. So we have over 20 different data platforms that we connect to. We have big data. We have small data. We have wrangle data through tools like Alteryx and Trifecta. We have things that are built with SQL. We have um, things that come out of SAS. We have file-based things like Excel and Access and statistical files. And we support all these different branches that uh, have completely different data needs with different uh, desired frequencies, whether it be live or extract, and, and just all these different scenarios that are just, uh, there's a whole mixture of all these different things and needs for Tableau across the firm. Uh, we're big into mobile and we're moving more and more in that direction. So we have executives that now, um, in the past, they would have printed PDFs and decks out on their desk and ask for that. Now they say, don't bring those. You know, we've got the analytics. We have Tableau public. We can just look at this on our iPads. We can look at this on the computer and we can click through and interact and understand what's happening today and be a little bit more proactive in what we're doing and not think about the past and be reactive. And we have sales teams that are out on the road understanding their different districts and understanding them on mobile dashboards, actually jumping on there and understanding all of their consumers and all of the people that they sell to. Um, and we have a lot of embedded uh, different things. So we have uh, real-time market transactions. We have some dashboards that come in real-time all the time, and we're always uh, looking at live refresh connections. We have integration with Salesforce.com. We're working on an external server that will be built for some of our external partners. Um, we have full analytic applications where teams have just built um, their application around Tableau using the JavaScript API and the REST APIs. Uh, just building things that are seamless with Tableau and, and integrating Tableau and all the, the value that you get with the product into their applications for their users. <clears throat> so a little bit more about my team. So uh, my team is the Tableau Center of Excellence for the entire bank. Uh, so we pretty much do, like I said, everything to make Tableau a success at the firm um, and just to you know, integrate it with everything that we can. So a couple things I'll talk through here. My team packages and releases Tableau. So we take the new versions, we understand what's coming, we test them, we plan for the version that's best suited to what we need and the new features that come with it, and then we release it to both all the, the servers and all of our desktop users in kind of one push and swoop. Um, we have training, so our team is not just out in the server land, minding our own business, just trying to give them the server and the experience, we're actually trying to integrate best practices and best habits. So we're out there teaching classes. We're doing desktop introduction classes. We're doing best practices classes. We're doing them in person. We're recording them so that users can um, get on there and understand exactly what's happening all the time. And we do that for users as well. So um, just so users know how to, to interact with Tableau server, not just for the desktop users. Uh, we do a lot of uh, office hour support. So what that means is, you know, with us being the firm stance and team for Tableau, we pretty much have everybody asking us for every little question that they have. So that wasn't really supportable. So what we did was we set up these biweekly office hour sessions so developers, when they have questions, can set up time with us and talk to us and say, hey, here's my questions, here's my issues. 
what can you do to help me? And then we talk through and guide them on, on solutions. And we engage with teams as well. We even do development for some teams just to get them uh, started and on, on the way into good behavior with Tableau. So uh, we do a lot of things with different business units that we actually just jump in, understand their data, say this is how we would do it, here's a starting point, here's how you should go forward. Um, and we promote best practices. So we're always out reading all the latest blogs, all the latest papers, um, everything from the Zen to all the different things that you can read online to all the videos that Tableau releases and everything. We're always trying to understand that and then make that into our culture and, and deliver that to Tableau so that, or to our users so that they know you know, what they should be doing. It shouldn't just all be cross tabs. It shouldn't be a color for every dimension. There's a lot of different things that you should know. As I mentioned, we test and implement the new feature, so we're always partnering with Tableau on beta and alpha and delivering our feedback and, and seeing how it fits into our roadmap and understanding just really what's coming in the product so that we can plan accordingly for our server, for our users, and for our developers. And uh, we kind of put all of this on one firm-wide portal. So we have one portal uh, that just really has everything from how do I get Tableau to how do I set my users up to how do I get a project to where do I go for those training opportunities and what are the best blogs to read and how do I consult and engage with you? So all of that's in one place that we just keep updated. So the reason I talk through all of that is you don't just have to stand up a server and be done. There's a lot of ways that you can just impact all of your Tableau users and work with them and, and bring this conference and all the things you learn here back to your users. Um, and that brings me to the last point, which is report and analyze data from all the server environments. So this is kind of the topic at hand, is we're going to talk about how we take all this information, all these different servers and users and consumers, and bring that into one application where we can understand what's happening. So that kind of leads into, so if anybody's been in attendance to Steve and Jason, they're both my colleagues, um, they've done Tableau uh, presentations for the last two uh, Tableau conferences, and this is kind of a quote from one of their presentations is, Tableau has the disruptive power to create an analytics-driven culture that affects decision-making across all of J.P. Morgan Chase. So it's a little wordy, but it's, it's really, in a nutshell, Tableau can change things. Tableau has uh, you know, the capability to really bring and drive culture and drive change and bring analytics to executives and users and lead to real change across the business. Um, so going into why we need uh, what we're gonna show here with this portal. So there's a lot of things that as server admins or um, just anybody on the tech side that you have questions about. So you know, what is being accessed on Tableau server? Uh, you know, what's actually being used and what's just sitting there idle and not ever being used, um, that maybe we can just kind of remove that and not take up space that we don't really need. Uh, are data sources being shared? So uh, I don't want my users to just connect to a data mart, pull it all down, and then just the next user does the same. I want them to leverage um, properly created data sources and share them amongst each other so that, number one, we don't waste the space, and number two, we have a single point of truth. So. Um, ties into this how big are the extracts. If I see something that's you know three gigs every time you pull it down, you're probably pulling some data that you don't really need. You're pulling down the entire mart, you're pulling down record level, or what I see often is I'm pulling down 10 years of data. I don't know what you're really doing with 10 years of data, but some people do that, as I think we're all aware. How long do uh, items sit in queue? So if I have all these extracts that are sitting and these subscriptions and these tasks sitting, how long are they sitting there waiting to actually get through and run through? So should I kind of um, evaluate all my schedules and, and understand them and move things around so that things aren't sitting and waiting 30 minutes, 20 minutes just to go through and run through the extract? Who actually has access and who's using it? So when you have a specific user count, you wanna know that the people that you're giving access to are actually leveraging that access. Um, so if they're not, let's take them off or let's understand why they're not using it. Maybe we can better educate them. Um, so not only do the items sit in queue for a long time, are they actually completing successfully? And if not, why aren't they? So understanding the percent and the volume of extracts that are failing and understanding the root cause and working through that to kind of work through some solutions and maybe additional opportunities to educate my end users and my developers. And how many concurrent users are on the server? So um, 
you know, and building up a big server environment um, and you, you start to grow, you need to understand how much concurrency you have because maybe your server starts to not handle, maybe it starts to buckle under the load and that performance starts to draw down a little bit. So understanding all these things and so many more questions is, is really why you need this information. There's some things that are built into Tableau. There's the monitoring pages and I'll reference those a couple times throughout the demo that are built there and available um, at the site level and for the entire server. But there's a lot of things that when you go down to the next level, when you look at a project level or you wanna see some of the things that I'll show you, you really can't get to them unless you go back to the data and the, and the Postgres environment and go through that. So um, we had questions as I showed and so we built tabs by to help us listen to our server. So uh, like I said, I wanna spend a good amount of my time in Tableau. So that's the goal. Let's see if this works fine for me. I'm gonna switch to a different laptop. And uh, I've got this on Tableau Public. So we'll just uh, scroll down here for a moment. Bear with me. Smaller side, let me, there we go. You guys see that okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so a couple of disclaimers about this before we get started. So this is, uh, what I mentioned is this is Tab Spy. So this is the first page we're gonna talk through for usage. So this is all sandbox data. This is also mass data. We of course don't have a bunch of projects that are named projects and users called users. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, this is, uh, like I mentioned, so sandbox data. In the real version, you could select the different server and actually that would change the navigation and change what you're seeing to the different server so you can kind of play around and look through that. So uh, I'll talk through some of the components of how I built this after I go through the demo of some of these screens, uh, just so you know that that's coming. So this is built in a way that, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, it's supposed to be seamless. It's supposed to be kind of one application. This is all Tableau, there's no JavaScript or anything here. Uh, we've just got Tableau inside of Tableau, but it, with a couple clicks, I can change these panes and actually change the topic so that I'm, I'm going through without you know, changing filters or going to different pages. It's all one page that I can easily click through to understand and go through really what I wanna dive into. So again, this is the usage page. So uh, a lot that we can explore and understand here inside of usage. Uh, so we begin over on the left side with a list of all of our projects. As I mentioned in my environment, project is equivalent to basically a group using Tableau. So these are all of our different groups that are using Tableau all the users beside those, and then some different uh, kind of uh, time-based elements on the right side. So uh, we've got the monthly totals, and the blue there represents the as of this date in the month um, volume. So that gives me a kind of a sense of, if I look at October, this same time in September, this is where we were at. So um, different ways you can build things just to understand and get a, a second level of knowledge there, because if I just had the volume for October, I wouldn't get the sense that I'm on track to exceed or about on track with September, especially when I roll into the new month, I, the tiny bar is really useless unless I add that blue component to see where was I in the previous month. And then, of course, down here we have the breakout by the day of the week, and we have the breakout by the time of day, and the heat map on the right side that shows day and month. So all this information is uh, just, the, it's, it's drillable and filterable, and it's meant to be kind of a seamless user experience. So if I'm interested in this first project, and let's say you know I as a user notice there's a lot of usage on this first project, I can click that. There we go. I can click that, and it's gonna filter everything. So it filtered all the charts on the right, but it also uh, brought up a list of workbooks below it, if you'll notice that. So now I can not only see this one project and see kind of the total in the last 30 days and that little bit of a trend, I can see what breaks up into that uh, project usage, which workbooks, is it one workbook or several? And um, the same, I can see the users. So this tells me a couple things. It's not just one workbook, they have several popular workbooks, but they have one user that's really engaging with their content the most. So this is an opportunity for outreach. I can say, hey user, I noticed that you've used Tableau a lot, 
Can you tell me a little bit about your experience and, and what it's been so far? And maybe we can work with your developers or work with that team just to understand why they're using it. And maybe that's a, a op opportunity to show other teams, hey, this is how you engage your users. Uh, and I can see that they've really jumped up in September. October, they've fallen down a little bit. And they really just pretty much start in September. And they're active specific days of the week and in the middle of the day. And I'm going to get a different narrative based on my different projects. So if I clear out of this, just click on it again, and then I click through, I see a different project. It filters again. And this is kind of a different story. It's one workbook that's popular, and they've got a whole lot of different users. So uh, just clicking through and changing these projects and changing these filters and going to the projects that you want to see and the workbooks you want to see, you're just going to get different stories. That the, the real thing here is to give you questions, give you, give you uh, opportunity to go further, and give you reasons to engage and work with your users and understand what's happening. Uh, another example where this project really only just started using too much. Uh, we've got a couple workbooks. In October, they started killing it. So um, just depending on the project, you're going to get different narratives. So the other good p part of this dashboard is uh, this is all the count of views. So maybe that's not the most dis interesting thing to you. Maybe you don't care too much about the count of all the team people that are using the views. Maybe you just want to see the actual count of the users. So maybe that's more meaningful for you. So just changing that, toggle the entire dashboard. Everything works the same way. But now I'm looking at the count of users. So I can see different stories in my data. I can see that there is a project here that has a, um, 72 users, and they're probably pretty popular. And just changing again, I can see concurrency. So changing this, you know, there's a calculation behind the scenes, but everything else works the same. In a 30-minute bucket, what is the typical concurrency that I have? So I've got one team that concurrently has 16 users. Again, maybe I just reach out to them and say, you know, I notice you have a lot of people using your content at the same time. Let's talk about why. Let's talk about how we can transfer that knowledge to other teams. Um, and yeah, the user, so the, I didn't change that because it would always be one. So you're talking about this right here. Yeah, so that, I just left that to be views. So um, otherwise, it would always be one because you're looking at one user. So um, that's just the count of views. That part didn't change. So that one user still viewed it 5,400 or yeah, 5,500 times. That's kind of how it's set out. So uh, scrolling through here within the topic, there are sometimes more than one page. Um, so going in here to the overview, this um, is kind of a second level. So if I want a really just a high level view of my usage, I can see here how my current month rolls up with the previous month. So going a little bit more into detail of that chart that I had before and actually showing kind of the counts over time and seeing if things are moving in a direction that they'll surpass other, other months. And then just some simple built-in forecasting from Tableau. So no, this is all out of the box. It's just showing that our views, our users, and our concurrency, they're all on the rise, right? So that just tells me more information. Maybe I need to plan for more additional hardware or plan for more users up here in the upcoming month because maybe it's going to get to a point where you know I'm behind. I don't know that's coming. And now I got to figure out about how, getting, how I get more servers and more um, space so that things can run a little bit more smoothly. So just giving you that kind of future stance of what's coming. So kind of moving forward, I'm, there's a couple screens I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, a couple screens I'll just kind of jump through. Uh, so another important thing here, if we click on this, is performance. So again, just showing that navigation, I clicked on that. That changed the right side. So now I'm looking inside. Without ever leaving the screen, I'm looking at performance. So this one's pretty simple. What we've got here is a breakdown of the performance for each view, the average there. We've got the performance of the individual screens. We've got the daily performance, and we have a breakdown of every single one of those viewpoints. So every time that somebody clicks on a view, that's a, we get a little circle down there. So um, this is all standardly colored. So um, it, we have the light gray that we really want to try to achieve, maybe some middle gray. But for the most part, we want to stay away from that orange because that gives us that good performance that most users are expecting, that 5 to 10 second performance. Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, and that's actually a good point. So um, it is initial load. It does not go into, so if I open the dashboard and I click through things, that's not captured here. That's a good point I actually missed. So Postgres, um, what I'm gonna talk through, so performance is not 100% when you go to Postgres for performance. The only place you can really get true 100% performance and down to the click level is through the logs. That's the only place that that's actually captured. So this will give you kind of an indication and a general guidance into those, those items and those projects that you wanna look into. But if you wanna get real and actually understand pre precisely what the performance is, you wanna achieve that through the logs, through th something like a log shark. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of these are extracted each night. So depending on you know how much data you have, how many users you have, how much is happening on the Postgres, you'll probably wanna do extracts. I have a mixture of things. Um, some, some of them are live. It depends on what I need. You know, Performance is not something I need to know right now what performance is, but I could build a screen that use, leverages the live connection and just have the ability to flip between them. So there's kind of options in how you build that, but most of this is extracted. Yep. Hmm. Let's talk about that one after the after the session. That sound good? Yep. When you're dealing with your customers, is, is this okay if you mention the current session status that you need to talk about? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you get some people that uh, when they're in this red section, a lot of times they'll let me know, and then I can go over here and I can say, yep, I, I can see why you're probably not very happy because you're getting that, that poor performance. So. Um, yeah, there's definitely an indication and in there's a rate there of, of, of satisfaction with the product versus performance of the product. So um, yeah, so going through this a little bit, uh, other than that, there's not a lot of special things that are happening here. I can click on a project and filter things. Again, just going through those narratives. So this first project, very poor, very poor performance. They have an average of 60 seconds, uh, but they've only hit it three times. So probably not somebody I need to work with. You know, they, they're figuring things out. They've only hit it a couple times. This was a few days ago. So I'll give them time. I'll let them figure it out. And uh, I'll move on to the next one. So the second one, a little bit better, 48 seconds, but very similar to the first. They've only got a handful, uh, about five hits there. Um, let's just keep going. So this one, this is probably a better candidate to talk to. So this one, they have uh, a mixture of different views, probably about seven, eight views here. Um, different screens, and uh, most of them are pretty poor performance. Over average, over time, they're not doing very good. You see a lot of these dots down here on the right side are, are in that dark amber color. Uh, and another view I can see this in kind of a distribution is, yeah, a lot, if I look at the percent of them, a lot of those 60 plus percent of their views are in that red section. So this is a good way to talk through something else that we integrated in this application, which is you can, via an action, email people. So what we built into this uh, application here is the ability to send a mail to link. And what I would do is I would just click on this and I don't have this built into this version, but I click on it and the tooltip would say, send the owner an email. And so I click on that and it opens up in my Outlook or my email program and says, hey, project owner, this is your overall average performance and this is kind of your distribution. Here's some things that you can do and it will actually link them over to materials of how to best uh, manage your performance and work through that and, and how to contact us if they wanna start engaging with us to understand how we can work with them. So it's just something that we do in a lot of these screens is we don't just wait, we don't just say, oh, I'll send them an email later. We actually click through and just send them an email now and say, hey, we're here to help. We can work through you to get that performance that you're looking for. Uh, you just need to engage with us, okay? So going through the next big one is extract. So. Uh, specifically in our environment, we are very extract heavy. So it's important to me to note uh, the extract failures and how many of those are actually running through appropriately. So this particular screen tells me my failure rate over time. Do I have a lot of extracts failing? It shows me in the top right section the breakout of the reason why. So some arbitrary kind of text uh, calculations just to look for specific verbiage in there. Um, so it looks like in this particular case we have a lot of ODVC driver issues. So something we will probably wanna check with a little bit of a timeline beside that just to show whether it's popped back up. And this one looks like it was bad for a while, it's kind of tapered off and then it's bad again now recently. 
And then down below, we just have a breakout of the projects that have the most failures with their failure rate, and the same thing with the actual extracts themselves. So if I click through here and filter this, I can see all this information. One thing you'll probably call out here and, 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 and question on me is, I click on 1,077, you think that that top right chart would equal that uh, 1,000 uh, issues. But what I've done here is excluded historical errors. So anybody that's familiar with this uh, would know that uh, once something fails a number of times, typically five times, it will be categorized as historical errors and it won't actually count as anything else. It won't give you the details. It kind of just gets in a suspended status. So usually I keep those out of the, the, the counts unless uh, I, I need to go back and research those. So moving through this a little bit, Here's an example of, and I mentioned this earlier, was the status screen that's built into Tableau Server. So you don't always just have to build brand new screens. Sometimes the screens that are there do a lot of the job and maybe you just wanna make a couple changes. So anyone that's familiar with that screen, this is gonna look very similar. We've got, uh, for every single item in the day, we have a little bar and a Gantt view that just says, this is how long it ran and this is the status. So, but we made a couple changes. One thing that's important to us and it might be a little hard to see is we've got a light gray here. So that gray on the left side of the bars tells me the queue time. So especially in a real environment when I'm looking at production, I'll notice things where I'll see at a specific time, hey, there's a lot of gray here. A lot of things are queuing up and waiting for other things to go through. Let's probably move those things around. Otherwise, you don't get that information. You just get the time that it actually ran and the, the, the overall status of it, whether it succeeded or not. Uh, the other thing that we added here was the ability, number one, to see the information on the hover, but also to click on it to get the history. So that's another important thing is to know if something failed, is it always failing? And that's what this bottom chart shows is the status over time over the last 30 days. So another example might be this one right here. So here's a good example where back in September, it was good for a little bit, had some issues, had some issues, did good, did good, went all the way through, and then at some point it started failing. And this is where you'll see at the bottom there, the note is suspended. So that's that example where it's just kind of a duplicate error. And if I trace that back, I can say, oh, here's the original error. It looks like that specific ID lost access to a table. And so that's where I would reach out to them and say, hey, did you know that your ID lost access and everything's failing for you? Oh, if not, then maybe you should get that fixed. So. Um, and then finally, we have the server extract overview. And this is just kind of a holistic view of over time, over the days and everything. It shows me the extract count, the failure count, the run time, and the queue time. Those are the four big things of information that you need for every one of your extracts. So this tells me that we've definitely grown on the extract side. We've got a lot more recently. It shows the failures that the 21st hour of the day, we probably have a problem because that's happening every day. Uh, the run time, we're doing okay. There was a little bit of an issue. And then the wait time, it looks like there was one random time where we had some issues there. So nothing too big that jumps out of me, but that tells me in one view everything that I need to know about my extracts on this, this particular server. <clears throat> so I'll kind of just jump through the others real quickly. So data, this screen is just an example to show me what data people are connecting to. So it might be of interest to note if they're connecting to Excel and static files versus actual database platforms or the, whether they're connecting and moving to the specific databases that I anticipate that they should be based on the drive of the, the firm at, at large. Um, it shows me how many connections I have by site and it's broken out by the embedded versus published. Again, I wanna see things being published so that they're being shared. And then how wide are the analyses? So, uh, this just basically is a rate of connections per workbook. So this first site, I probably wanna say, hey, you're using 13 connections per workbook. Let's maybe talk about that because that's not a very good practice, right? <laughs> so uh, that's the data screen. Users, uh, another nice thing to know is, especially in that case where you have the subscription model or the count, is knowing how many of your users are on each site but more importantly, how many of them are actually leveraging the access that they have? So uh, this first group and this first project, they have 67 users. Two of them have used the product. So need to talk to that team, need to understand why they're not using it. And maybe it's just a, a learning opportunity for those end users. 
Um, size, another simple one just to know, this is another example that's very similar to the one built into the monitoring section of uh, tab, uh, Tableau Server. Uh, this one just has a couple of changes, like knowing the last used date of the object. So uh, again, an opportunity to clean things up. If I see something that's been sitting and hasn't been used in over 30 days, is there a reason why? Is there a reason why we're taking space from the server to give it just that, you know, that take up that 680 megabytes or that 500, and three megabytes, maybe this, those are things that we can clean up. And then access is just a simple screen to just um, show if, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I need to know uh, if my user has access. It's, this is something that's not always that easy to tell in Tableau server, so connecting to Postgres and building this out, you can just search for a user, search for a project, and say, yep, they do. Hey, but they've never logged in. Again, just adding those couple of things that you can get the narrative of, yeah, they have access, but they're not using it, so let's talk to them. And then finally, we're gonna move up to the last one, which is actually the one that starts off when you open the application, which is the summary screen. So this screen is really just kind of a culmination of all those other screens. It tells you a lot of the information that we walked through in the other, the other sections, which is, you know, what's my queue time? What's my failure rate? Uh, how many active users do we have? And what's the breakout of when they last used the content? But some other things that I wanna know, like how many new projects do we have? How many projects are publishing this week? Um, how much is being published each day of the week? Uh, just a lot of information about what's happening uh, in total across my server. So understanding all that information is really important um, at a glance. And then that gives me a reason to go into the different environments and, and go into the different screens. Um, and then of course at the bottom there you can see we just have a total line. So these are all the objects. So if, if I ever get asked how many users do we have, it's right there. How many uh, worksheets, how many projects. It's all right there in, in one screen. So again, that's Tab Spy. So that's the version that I'm showing here. There's some other screens that are built into the version that we have at work. So showing things like desktop usage and subscriptions and schedules and, and other things. Uh, this is kind of just a, a toned down version of it. Um, but it's really pretty easy to build something like this uh, for yourself and for um, your setup. So I'm gonna switch back to the presentation here. Okay. And uh, so a couple quick wins that we had just building this application and understanding the data and working with it. Um, so the extract errors. Um, just going through those extracts and understanding why things were failing uh, and go getting to the root cause led to immediate cleanup in those extracts. So we identified some driver issues that were affecting a lot of our um, users on specific platforms. So we worked on identifying a fix with them and installing that on the desktop side and that resulted in a, a quick 20, 25% uh, uh, reduction of extract errors across the server. Um, adjusting the process topology. So just understanding the performance that users were getting and the queue time and all those different variables made us change the topologies, change how many background or processes we have versus these QL processes. And adjusting that and knowing where you should go with that is always gonna give your users a better experience. Uh, governance reviews. So there's a lot of cases where just looking at the different environments together, we identified teams that were just never going to production. So uh, we said, hey, you, you really gotta go to production. Is there a reason you're not doing that? And other things that we noticed, so databases they shouldn't be connecting to or, or different access issues, uh, just having all that data in front of us led us to understand what was coming. Schedule changes. So again, talking about that queue time. So knowing that certain times of the day, certain days of the week, there was a lot of queue time, led us to completely change our schedule process. So we implemented new schedules, we staggered them, we uh, gave them different priorities, and we, we took the history of the extracts to assign them different priorities. So if you're always gonna be slow, we're not gonna give you high priority. If your extract takes an hour to run, you're gonna be at the bottom of the list, so those ones that go in, in, 20, in you know, a minute or 20 seconds can get to the top of the line ahead of you. Um, user cleanup, so again, just knowing that users aren't leveraging the content that they have, that's an easy cleanup item where you just say, you know, if you're not gonna use it, let's go ahead and clean you up, and we build a process around that so that if users don't use it within 180 days, they're cleaned out of the system. And just the engagement, you know, just having that, that point of engagement with developers just always leads to, you know, quick wins and better development, just saying, hey, we're here, just so you know, we can work with you. Here's how we can help you getting the materials and, and just starting that dialogue with them to uh, get the process started on doing better development is a, a very big thing when you're working with your users. 
And here's some uh, tips on how you can do this kind of stuff too. So the work groups database uh, is the Postgres instance that I've been talking about. If you're not familiar with it, every installation of Tableau Server comes with this installed. It's automatically there. Uh, all you have to do is run a command if you haven't already from the server and just uh, to enable Postgres reporting. And one of the big misconceptions here is you don't have to be a server admin to get the data. That's, that's just not true. So what you can do is um, just get the password. So it, this is the only place where this password is used. It's a read-only account on Postgres. So it doesn't give you any rights to change anything on the Tableau server. You just need that password. And you can do all these kind of things that I've been talking about so far. Uh, here's just a simple example from Postgres. This is the user view and the groups view with a join table. So this gives you the users by group. So you can get that, that kind of that last section where if you wanted to see all the users for every one of your groups and say, when was the last time they leveraged the content or actually leveraged their access, you can identify that here. Uh, a more advanced example, this is kind of the performance side. So this goes through the actual HTTP request and gives you that. It joins it over to users and then brings over some more information and some more attributes like sessions and sites. And, and uh, hopefully that data model that they announced today in the keynote would make this process a little bit more uh, simple. Yep. The, uh, I noticed that your forecast is six months of data time. Mm -hmm. No, so that's built out of Tableau Desktop. So there's some built-in kind of standard forecasting models in there. They're not really robust or advanced or anything, but um, as long as it has enough history, you can adjust for seasonality and things like that and apply that directly in the tool. Yep. Um, so yeah, so that's just an uh, a little bit more advanced and you can get definitely more and more advanced. You can, um, most of mine is built off of SQL um, and, and more advanced statements that uh, you know use some different uh, temporary tables and things like that. But uh, depending on what you need, you can uh, just do everything right there in the uh, UI for the connections. Uh, the third step here, or sorry, sorry, this is still part of the first step, is uh, understanding the work groups database. So uh, this is a image from the data dictionary in Tableau's website. So it's a lot of material, but it's very well documented. So you can actually get in here, understand all the tables and views and get your information about them and also all the fields and how they relate with like foreign primary keys and all that kind of stuff. So um, like I said, there's a lot of information there, but it's all documented. If you just did a quick search on uh, Tableau's website, you could find the materials for that. Uh, the next step, so step number two, is leverage some published content. So you don't have to just do all this on your own. It's not just kind of dropping you in the deep end and saying, hey, figure it out. There's some work that others have done that's already published and available for you. So the first one I would recommend is the Shareable Data Sources by Matt Cole. So Matt is a uh, member of the Tableau team, and he spent a lot of time actually going through Postgres, understanding all the tables, all of the data there, and establishing relationships, building the connections, building calculations, cleaning up the fields, and then putting them out on Tableau's website. So he has things for content and users and background tasks and others that all you have to do is download those, them into your network, repoint them to your server, and then you're ready to go and you can start developing. Uh, another thing you can look at is some users and some developers in the community have built pre-built views. So this is kind of another step in that direction where not only did Mark, for example, Mark Jackson, build uh, the connection, he went ahead and built some uh, dashboards. Now, this is a couple years ago, and there's a lot of options here, but Matt, Mark's uh, content here is, is, is very highly regarded. Uh, so you can get on there, download it, point it to your server, and you've already got views. So even if you plan to build your own uh, kind of uh, structured environment like I did, uh, you can just use this in the meantime. Just get yourself a, a step in the right direction. And then just in general, the server admin forum. So this is really the space on the forums where anything server related, uh, all the latest information, the latest tips and tricks and the latest questions can all be found here. So three specific things that I would, I would definitely um, learn those three and, and touch base with those and, and just understand what, what's available to you. So those are very valuable resources. And then finally, create the content. So once you create the content, you're, you're pretty much good with those data sources. Uh, just the fourth tip, this is really optional, but I said I'd talk through this, so the navigation pane. Uh, this is something that's pretty easy to do in Tableau to build that kind of left-hand pane. 
uh, there's a few things here. So what you would do is create something in Excel. Uh, what you'd have is two columns. The first one would be your topic name. The second one would be the link of the dashboards themselves. Uh, so here you can include the question mark embed. If you're not familiar with that, that's a parameter that takes the embedded version of uh, the Tableau dashboard. And so it takes out the navigation. So that kind of plots it inside of the inner frame and uh, you've got it there. So going through that, once you uh, connect to that Excel and create that, you're gonna create the actual view inside of Tableau. It's as simple as dragging a few fields around just like this. So your, your topic to the rows and to the text and then make sure your link is on detail so it's on the view. And then from there, you're gonna create the dashboard itself. So drag that sheet over to your dashboard, uh, drag a web object from the dashboard pane on the left side over to the right and that's what you're gonna kinda use the navigation to change. And all you gotta do to do that is uh, create it a action. So essentially all we did was we created a data source, we built a view based on that, and then this action is basically saying, okay, when I click on sheet one, pass the link over to the, the object on the right. And so every time that I click on one of those navigations, it's just changing the link based on what I brought in from Excel to change um, which view I'm looking at. And that just has the, the, the avail uh, ability to have all of your content in one area. You could do that by just publishing everything as one workbook, but of course, you have all these different data sources that can become tedious and become a mess. This is a, a better practice of combining multiple content um, in one seamless uh, navigation area and then just publish it and schedule and give access. Now, as I mentioned before, it's, it's valuable information for us as server admins, but it's also very valuable for the users. Uh, so it's, it's important for them to know the same kind of information that we uh, capture as server admins. So just some, I'll kind of go through these real quickly, some questions the users might have. So are my users accessing the content that I've given to them? Um, who actually has that access, who's using it, so did I add a bunch of people and they're not actually leveraging or, or using my content? How long do my extracts sit in the queue? Are my jobs going through successfully or are they failing? And what kind of performance are my users seeing? So all information, all questions that I receive pretty much every day from users is what's happening with my content? How do I get some insight into that? And so TaskBuy gave us what we needed but we needed to build a version of that that was um, insightful, secure, and efficient for our users. So um, with a couple changes, we can use those same dashboards that we built and share them with users. So again, we're gonna open our, our handy Excel and we're gonna do two columns again. So the project name and the list of users that should see that project. So different ways that you can accomplish this, this could be, you know, this could be a table if you wanted to do that. This could be based on workbook or site, but for us, we wanted to say these are the users that should see all the uh, analytics that we've built, built for each one of the projects, so this is how we set it up. From there, you're just gonna join that Excel to your data connection inside of a data source uh, join, so a cross data source join. So uh, by doing that, so if we had all that performance, that whole section on the left side, and we join that by project to this, this Excel file, we're then bringing one re record for every one of those that has the list of the user. So we have a new column, user entitlements. Uh, and when we do that, so for every one of those projects, it says this is how many people that should see it, we create a calculation to check that. So if you're not familiar with it, inside of user filtering, we have an option inside of the calculations um, to check the username of the user that's logged in. So that's what that last part is there. It's just saying username. So my name's Zach Geis. It's pulling in Zach Geis when I'm logged in. And it's just saying for each of these records for that user access list, which is that column, is any of that Zach Geis? And if so, show it. So taking that, throwing it, throwing it on your filter shelf is a true false statement and making it true means that only those records that have my name when I log in are the ones I can see. And so just by creating a simple Excel file and refreshing that every day, and every time we get a new project saying these are the people that should see it, you can then create the same dashboards and say, here, everybody can use the same dashboards. You only see your content and you can have the same kind of perspective that we can it's just not at the server level. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, so it's 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 uh you don't get the extra row, so you don't want to yeah you don't want to duplicate the rows there. So um, it's just one column and it's delimited. So you can, and you can delimit it with anything. Um, it's really just checking for that combination of letters in that same um, series of uh, characters. Yeah. So um, kind of moving to the last couple slides here. So what comes next? Uh, so we're looking to integrate more directly with some of the open source tools for Tableau, like uh, LogShark and Tabmon, specifically LogShark, what we talked about with performance, where that's truly the only be best place that you can get performance. That's where we wanna integrate that so that, uh, and we're almost there where every night it runs through on the logs, it, it exports a dashboard and it's part of TabSpy so that you can get a lot of information there from the logs that you can't get elsewhere. So not only performance, root cause analysis. So if you ever get those session ID failure kind of things that you see in Tableau servers randomly that doesn't really tell you exactly what the issue is, you can get that from the logs or you can actually replay events that users have went through. So actually seeing the timeline of what they've clicked through and what they've filtered, uh, all things you can capture in, in the logs. Uh, building a lot of these screens that uh, have already been included, but just having all that thing. So you can check desktop usage. You can say, based on a command that you have apply to your desktop environment, you can get an actual record for every time that a user uses desktop. So if I have 30 users that are using desktop and I want to understand which ones are actually using it, maybe want to transfer license around, I can get that information. I can understand the schedules and subscriptions and whether they're coming on time. And then finally, just getting a little bit deeper in this analytics. So uh, if a user is accessing content, it's, it's nice to just know that, but it's nice to know if they're coming back repeatedly. So knowing those kind of user engagement things of how often are they coming back to my content and, and um, what is kind of the, the root cause of the performance issues and, and things like that, just kind of, kind of going to the next level. So it's already kind of macro to micro, but getting even mi more micro in uh, all those uh, issues and questions that we have. So. Uh, with that, that's my session. So, uh, so real quickly, um, you're going to see this slide a lot of times. Uh, this is after every session, so please do complete the session survey. It's useful for everybody. It's useful for me to understand if the, the session was useful for you. I hope it was. I will stay around for any questions you guys have. And again, there's my information. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you. Questions? Oh. Yep. That's a tricky question. So um, I would like to, but I work at a big uh, financial institution, so it's now proprietary. Uh, my goal eventually, I would like to build a version. Like I said, I do a lot of kind of offline work, so I'd like to build a version of these dashboards that are available at some point, but I can't say that they'll ever make it. Yeah, kind of same thing, but a lot of that information you can find, and I really would check out Matt Coles, like I mentioned, because he's got six uh, data sources, I think, now that'll give you 90% of what you ever need. So I do have one more question. Yep. Uh, what server licensing are you on? Yeah, so we're enterprise uh, subscription user-based. Subscription user-based, so they all click by browser users, and then they don't have subscriptions to all these services? Yeah, we as a corporation have subscription, yep. Wow, cool, thank you. Yep, yep, back there. Right. Yeah, we have a lot of alerting in place, so there's a lot of alerting that you can build in, you know, on the machine level and on the Tableau level. So we've leveraged a lot of that built-in kind of stuff. We actually built some screens that do alerts as well that are built off of live connection. So if you've used uh, work, work, workbook alerting inside of Tableau, you can kind of basically say, hey, if there's this many extract failures this hour, alert me, and I get an email right then. So there's a lot of ways you can build kind of alerting into your machine. Um, that kind of gives you that insight then. And uh, it's just something that we, we have, uh, even for extract failures, we have a whole process where when an extract fails, it generates a queue or a ticket into our queue and actually says, hey guys, just so you know, here's a failure that happened today. So we're always trying to get those extracts lower because everybody at every executive level knows this is how many failures we have in Tableau. So it kind of makes us have uh, perspective on what's happening, so. Yeah. How 
Yeah, the way that that works, so when, when I say 25 servers, so w my team owns the biggest infrastructure that supports most of the bank, and there's a couple little environments that have their whole you know, life cycle of dev test, and those ones we report off of, but they're different teams. So I can speak kind of on ours. So the data, um, we don't really shepherd or steward any of that. So that's really on the, the, the development teams. They work through that, and essentially the way that we go through the route is we have a dev test pr production. We allow the developers to do what they want with dev and test, and then they have to go through a migration, migration process to get to production, and the data and the dashboards are uh, jointly located. Now, there are some teams when it makes sense where they have multiple projects where basically you create a shared environment for your data sources for the project, for all those projects. So there's different ways you can set it up, but for the most part, it's just kind of one and one. You have a project, and your data and your dashboards are all there, and it goes up through the process. Oh, okay, so you mean from the Postgres side. No, so that's kind of a goal, probably a 2019 goal, is to take that data and land it somewhere centrally. Right now, we go the route of, very tedious route of, um, I've built all of these screens for every single server 25 times. Um, now, luckily, we built, uh, so we use Interworks, we use the deployment tool, so I, I wrote a script that basically says, if I tag one of these workbooks as migrate, every night it'll go through and re-migrate for all the other ones and actually over, overwrite them with the right cr credentials. So I don't have to actually go through 25 instances, it just copies them, basically. Yep. Yeah, yep. Uh, so we're, we're um, active active. So we, we have in two different data centers, we have a copy of the repository. So if that ever went down, then we'd kind of be out of it for a little bit. But it's not, I mean, this is not, you know, this is not something we need to have back up in two hours. This is something we can wait a little bit when it comes back. Okay, right here. Yes. Right. Yeah, so I mean, you're, you're never gonna get to a point where the, the data is not a ever uh, redundant and duplicated. It's just kind of doing the best that we can. So going through those best practices, letting them know the route that we wanna go, and then when we see things and we work with users and we identify things, that's where we reach out to them and say, hey, you know, we, we realize that you have redundant data that other teams are using. Let's get you guys together and talk about how we can share this and, and work in a way that it's a little bit more, um, you know, efficient how we're building it, so. It's not the best answer, but it's kind of just a as-is kind of basis. So, yeah, I haven't got this side. So, uh, right here? Do you govern that data at your expense? No. No, so we don't, we don't do any governing of the data sources. Uh, what we would do in some, some cases, if a team comes to us and says, we don't know if we can connect to this, we don't know how to get access, then we usually know the right contacts on the database side, and we can kind of you know, part, partner them together. But um, at this point, with so much content and so many, so many users, it's difficult to actually have a, a hand in everything that goes to production. So it's something that we, we always, as we see them, try and implement best practices and work with them, but um, we don't have a hand in everything thing that goes through. It's just too big of an environment. Yeah. Right here? Is there a way to set constraints on the user reaction to the new project or is there any way you can do that as well as lock permissions? No, you can do it both ways. So there's uh, there's managed and locked permissions at every project. So a, a locked permission is exactly the, the latter scenario where if I lock permissions, everything in that project will have that permission set. Manage basically means you can set permissions for every single object inside of there. So at a project, you just say, this is manage permissions, and then for every workbook, you can say, this group should see this, this group should see this, and, and kind of adjust it accordingly. And right there? Oh, uh, we're currently on 2018.13, yep. Right here? Uh, we are uh, seven members. Yeah, seven members that handles all this stuff. Right. How much of your data is 
Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we wear a lot of hats. So that's kind of as we mentioned, as I mentioned in, when I was talking about our team is, you know, it's, it's something that we just try and do a couple times a week is go through these dashboards and say, hey, what's happening? Who are the people and contacts that we need to reach out to? And, um, you know, we have so many requests. We have, um, you know, dozens and dozens of questions and, qu and requests every single day that it just leads to a lot of engagements and a lot of talk. And it's just, you know, there's some people that have to wait, um, but we try and work through as many as we can. But there's nobody that we don't, we all kind of wear all the same hats. So none of us focus on, you know, training versus this versus that. We all kind of just try and do everything we can to implement new features, do the training, um, get users um, on the right path. Yep. There? Yeah, so um, we as a firm do about twice a year upgrades. Um, the reason that we do that, the servers are actually not that big of a pain for us. The servers are pretty easy to upgrade. The desktop is not so much. So getting the desktop out to thousands of users and we have physical users, we have virtual users, we have all these different types of machines. That's the part that's very difficult for us, is getting that out with all the drivers and all the relationships and everything and, and making sure it works for everyone. So we plan just you know, twice a year. And what we do is we, throughout the year, we plan and we, uh, you know, we attend conference, we understand what's coming in the future, and we say, these are the, the features that I want, these are the features that we need as a firm. And we say, okay, that's coming out in June, what release is that gonna be? And we start planning accordingly. So it's usually about twice a year and we just do everything in, at, at once. So um, when we went to 2018, we actually jumped from 10.3. So we hadn't had Hyper yet. So it was a little bit of a pain because we went production down because that was, you know, we can't really do migrations up once the, we upgrade the lower environment. So we went production down, which came with its own headaches, but for the most part was a pretty easy upgrade. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, so. Yeah, so typically the route would be we would upgrade our sandbox environment way ahead. So months ahead, we'd, we'd upgrade our sandbox environment, the same one that I use for the reporting here. And uh, we get as many users as we can, as many developers, you know, kicking the tires on it, understanding what's exactly happening. And then once we're happy with that, we'll set the cadence. So usually what we would do is we talk to what I consider kind of our sister teams, the ones that do the other environments that I mentioned, the niche environments across the server, and we say, hey, will you be able to do all your environments by X date so that we can do desktop? And they'd say, yeah. And so what we would do is we'd say, all right, it's time to do all the devs, it's time to do all the tests, it's time to do all the UATs, and we usually would stagger that about a week at a time. So within about a month across all the teams, we'd have all the environments upgraded. No, so right now um, the developers can publish to the dev region and the test region, and then they have to submit a ticket uh, to go to production. And we have a deployment team that uses that Interworks tool that, that I mentioned, and they just say, okay, I've got a ticket, and this is what should be migrated, and they migrate it to production. That's just kind of our policy is we have to have a ticket system to go to production. Our goal here in um, the next few months is to, we've written some commands and some scripts that will automate things a little bit more. Um, so the goal is somebody submits a ticket, it triggers over to a file and a script and it says, okay, go ahead and upgrade or migrate this content. So there's no people actually doing those commands and going through the effort. Right there? Um, we, we usually would reach out to teams. We don't typically, we're not typically very heavy handed. We don't just go out there and delete it. What we'll say is we'll reach out and say, hey, we noticed that it's been 180 days that you haven't used the content. Um, we're gonna go ahead and plan to delete this in a week if you don't have any objective, uh, objections. And I'd say oftentimes they don't have any objections and we delete it. And some cases where there's kind of a, um, you know, a contractual obligation to, to store the content, even though nobody's using it, they're obligated to keep the content, then we don't push them too hard, like if they have a monthly report that they have to keep out there. Um, but for the most part, that's how we handle that. Right here. 
Um, it was, so this was kind of my side project. So I did this a lot um, when I was had a little bit of downtime. So for the most part, this took me relatively six months. I'd say somewhere around six months to build it. Um, you know, just spending a few hours each week working on it. Um, I focused uh, specifically on this. There's a version of this that was built for our end users that another uh, member uh, created that uses the same data sources that I created. So this particular application was uh, majority uh, built by built by me. What, when you say product reporting, can you? Um, Yeah, we don't spend a lot of time actually building dashboards for teams. Um, the only time that we do is when I mentioned up at the front is uh, engagements where we actually um, engage with teams. And there, there's a, it's called our jumpstart program where what I mentioned was, you know, we jump in and we say, this is how we would do it. We get them started. That's really the most time that we spend doing some development and that's for a few weeks. Um, other than that, we don't usually spend a lot of time developing. Um, it's really just focusing on Tableau at, at large at the firm and, and presentations and, and things of that nature. We do our best. That's another one of those things. It's just it's difficult to have a hand in all. You know, we have uh, I think right now seven thousand workbooks on Tableau Server, or just on our production. So it's it's very difficult to have a hand in every one of those and say, but. Um, we try and just make sure that everyone knows what's happening. When they start Tableau with us, we let them know all the materials and we have them go through training. So we do our best to get them in that right path, but actually you know, making sure that they adhere to it is not something we do too much proactively. No, so I think that's really the, the, I mean, that's something that you really want to be very accurate with is performance. So that's something that you want to get in the log. Um, other than that, like I said, the kind of the root cause stuff. So if you get an error on the server, it's not going to tell you exactly what's happening. You might get some information, but it's, it's going to be very general. If you really want to know why something failed or something like that, then you want to get from that. And then, like I said, if you want to actually re replay activity, there's a whole add-on to, to LogShark for, it's called Tableau Replayer, that actually will show you what people click through and what they did. So those are kind of the three things that if you need any of that information, you want LogShark. Um, or logs. Other than that, most of everything is in Postgres. Right here. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, kind of Tableau experts, so they kind of have the role of the deployment team. They do that for multiple um, services and multiple products. So they kind of depend on the end user, the one that submitted the ticket to validate. So they kind of just, they'll say, hey, we've done the migration, can you validate? And then if they give them validation, then they're good to go. Um, we have some screens that just say this is the new content that's been published to Tableau Server. So we have some screens that will tell us what's new. So maybe that will give us some people to reach out to if we see some things that are happening that we don't really agree with. But uh, other than that, we don't, they don't really you know, push them or um, set any standards or anything like that. There? Yeah, it should be. Uh, I believe so. The session's recorded. Yep. Uh, I think we do got to wrap it up. So um, I'll be down here, So, or I'll walk outside if anybody has any other questions. So thanks for staying until the end.